Hi, everybody. I'm glad you're here. This is something that started out very, very small at the coffee plantation in Scottsdale, Arizona, that's growing and growing and growing. And through technology and necessity, we're really growing. And none of us are at the coffee plantation this morning. That would be far too dangerous with what we've got going on here, a place to uh, to have a, a meeting where there's, you know, zillions of people running in and out of would just not not cover it. This morning, we are going to talk about page one and possibly a little bit of page two. And if you've been around this format, we go very slow. We're very, very pedantic. We're very detailed-oriented. And what I'm going to attempt to do this morning, to the best of my ability, is I'm going to present Bill's story in a way that will endear it to you, but will also make it more utilitarian, not just for you and your recovery, but ultimately for the people that you sponsor. Because what we're going to see in Bill's story is we're going to see many things that maybe were never pointed out to you before, and maybe it wasn't just that the people didn't know to point it out to you. It may not have been something that they felt was important or whatever. But the bottom line is, is that we're going to see some things this morning in Bill's story, hopefully, that will help you point out to your sponsees the original intent of this story. And what is the original? By freeconferencecall.com. Hello? Am I being heard out there? Somebody unmute and let me know I'm being heard because I just, somebody just, some heard. recording. You're being heard. You're okay, heard. thank you. Okay, good. What is the original intent of Bill's story? The original intent is to identify in with Bill. And that if we can identify in with Bill and we can look at the way Bill thinks and we can look at the way Bill drinks and we can look at the way Bill reacts, then maybe we can make a better determination as to whether or not we are alcoholics or compulsive overeaters or we are not. And if we also look at this story, we're going to find out that it is definitely divided into two sections. The first eight pages of Bill's story are about Bill's plunge into the nadir of his alcoholism. And the second eight pages, pages 9 through 16, are about how a recovery was affected therefrom by utilizing spiritual means. But since we're just on page one, and before we get into, into the actual words of the page, we're going to take a look at who this guy is, Bill Wilson. And we're going to look at Bill, and we're going to see that he was born on the 26th of November, 1895. And his parents were, <clears throat> excuse me, Emily and Dorothy. Excuse me, Dorothy was his sister. Emily <clears throat> and Gilman. Sorry about that. Emily Griffith and Gilman Wilson were his parents. And he had a sister, Dorothy. And Dorothy is going to play into the tapestry of this story because Dorothy and Bill were close all their lives. But Dorothy is going to marry a guy by the name of Dr. Leonard Strong. And Dr. Leonard Strong is going to play significantly into the story because the situation is going to be he is going to help Bill get into the town's hospital. He is also going to hook Bill up and Hank, Hank up way later with a guy in the Rockefeller inner circle named Willard Richardson. And that's going to play into it. So Dorothy is definitely going to play into it. Some of this stuff we're going to discuss in a couple of weeks, and some of this stuff we're going to discuss later. But this is the reason that we go slow is so we can sort of concentrate on where we're at. Now, Bill's father was an alcoholic. And in 1906, Bill's father and mother are going to divorce. And the number one reason why they're going to divorce is because his mother, Emily, was sick and tired of Gilman's drunkenness. Now, 
Gilman's father was also an alcoholic. And Grandpa Wilson, his marriage didn't divorce, they didn't divorce, but his marriage was terrible, terrible. And the reason that they really had a bad marriage was because of the fact that he was an alcoholic. So Bill is very seriously impacted by the alcoholism of other people. And as such, he is going to get, as a child, this impression that alcoholism rips families apart. Knowing that and intellectualizing what he is seeing around him, is not obviously going to stop him, is it? Just like us. So can I identify with Bill so far? You bet I can. I certainly can. So in 1906, Bill Wilson and Dorothy will go to live with Fayette and Ella Griffith in East Dorset, Vermont. And in East Dorset, Vermont, they will be children of divorce at a time in 1906 when divorce was extremely, extremely unheard of. When I was a little boy in Chicago, I went to a grammar school, and there were three families, three kids in my school, the whole school, that were products of divorce. Dare I say today, if I went back to that same school and those same kids, there might be three who are not the products of divorce. And even though that's very sad, it is the way our society goes sometimes. But the bottom line, why I'm pointing this out is Bill already felt different. And we as addicts, we as compulsive overeaters, bulimics, anorexics, we feel very different from the people around us at a profoundly early age. So can I relate to Bill? You bet I can. Now, Bill was a very determined child. Bill was a very smart child. He was a very hardworking child. He was a child who, when he got his mind set on something, he went for it. He took the Edison test as a kid, as a little boy. Thomas Alva Edison would offer a test to young boys and to see if they had an acumen for math and or science, and he would let them apprentice with him when they were a little older. If they passed the test, Bill passed the test, but he never did apprentice with Edison. And one of the things he said later in life was he knew Edison was always going to be the number one man, and he wanted to be his own number one man. Can I relate to that? You bet I can. Bill found a violin up in Grandpa Griffith's attic, and he practiced tirelessly on the violin and became co-first chair of his school's orchestra playing the violin. And there are many pictures of Bill and Lois playing music together later in their life. And if you've been to Stepping Stones in New York, in Bedford Hills, Bill's violin is still there. And you can see it, it's on display, and Lois's piano is also on display as well. And they played many times together, and that's somehow you know, how they passed some of their time. Remember, they were married at a time before television. Well, they were married during television, too, but a lot of their marriage, a lot of their relationship was pre-TV, so they would entertain themselves by playing music. Bill found an old baseball glove up there, too, and became starting shortstop, and he became co-captain of his school's baseball team. He also found a book, and he read the book, and in the book it said that only an aborigine could fashion a boomerang that would actually come back to you. So he cut part of his headboard with a saw, and his wooden headboard, you can see it today if you go to East Dorset, Vermont. Now, they come with you to make sure you don't take any souvenirs, but the boomerang that he made and the headboard that he cut are still there, and you can see them. He fashioned a he uh, not a headboard, he fashioned a boomerang, sorry, he fashioned a boomerang that actually came back, and when it did, the first time, it almost took Grandpa Griffith's head off, but it did come back to him, and he was extremely proud of that. Bill suffered his entire life from an anxiety disorder, an inferiority complex, and he also suffered from depression. 
When Bill was a teenager, the love of his life was Bertha Bamford, and Bertha Bamford was pre-Lois. He didn't know Lois at that time, but Bertha Bamford was the love of his life. And Bertha went to New York City for what was described to Bill as a routine surgery. And Bertha, as a teenager, died on the operating table. And Bill, at that age, as a teenager, fell into the first of his many, many deep dark depressions, and Bill was clinically depressed his entire adult life. He was always in therapy, and uh, later on in life, he would come under the uh, psychiatrist. His psychiatrist was Dr. Harry Tebow, and Harry Tebow in 1949 would write a paper. I'm getting ahead of where we are right now, but I'm just filling you in. Harry Tebow would write a paper, and the paper would be accepted by the American American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and uh, at that time they accepted alcoholism as an illness, and how that also is going to play back is something we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. When Dr. Silkworth in 1950 found that the AMA, the American Medical Association, and the American Psychiatric Association had accepted alcoholism as an illness. He told Bill Wilson for the 11th printing of the book, which occurred in, in 50, late 50, that you can put my name in there now, and then Silkworth died in 51. So for the first 10 printings of the big book of AA, you don't have Dr. Silkworth's name, and in the 11th printing you do he gave his permission because of the tireless work of harry tebow who was bill's psychiatrist who you know worked with bill on his depression later on in life just as kind of a note bill would come under the uh he would come under the uh, uh auspices of dr um uh, Timothy Leary, and Timothy Leary told Bill that he wanted to put him on uh, LSD. It's not the kind of LSD that you see the kids taking today, but it is a clinical cousin of that street LSD, and Bill was on LSD as a treatment for his depression, and he really liked it. You know, He thought, oh, I've, I've discovered something here. So at a lot of the conventions late in Bill's life, late 50s, early 60s, Bill would die in 71, they would actually have to shut Bill up at conferences because he wanted to tell everybody about this wonderful uh, asset that he was taking that was helping him with his depression, and they had to stop him from doing that. But Bill suffered his entire life from clinical depression. Can I relate to that? No, I don't suffer from clinical depression, but I, I suffer from other chronic conditions like AFib and, and being a moron. No, I'm not a moron, but being a what Whatever, you know, a, a, a squirrel brain, a being whatever, you know, we all have different things about ourselves that make us uniquely who we are. And many of these things are lifelong situations. It could be something very serious. It could be something very not serious, whatever it is. But we are terminally and clinically ourselves, aren't we? So can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet that I can. Absolutely can. So let's go to page one. And let's take a look at these words in ways that maybe, I don't know, but maybe you haven't examined them before. War fever ran high in the New England town to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. Plattsburgh is a city in upstate New York, and that's where Bill did some of his basic training for World War I. You'll see people in meetings all the time talking about how Bill was in World War II. No, he was not. He was in World War I. Okay? We were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. Now, Bill suffers from anxiety. Bill suffers from an inferiority complex. Bill suffers from depression. He puts on his military uniform. He puts on his outer garb. 
He puts on a shell, and people are applauding him. He is the toast of the town along with these other trainees. He wears his uniform, and he's being transported transformed into someone, something that he's always wanted to be, but never could be. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet that I can. You bet that I can. Moment sublime with intervals, hilarious. I was part of life at last. I was part of life at last. So here's Bill Wilson. He's no longer... This faceless kid, he's wearing his uniform, he's the toast of the town, he's part of life at last, and in the midst of the excitement, I discovered liquor. Now, when he was back in East Dorset, Vermont, he didn't drink much, did he? Because he knew that his father and mother split up. Now, his mother would go to Boston, Massachusetts, and she would become one of the nation's first female osteopathic surgeons. She would become a female osteopathic surgeon and osteopathic physician at a time when that was unheard of. And grand- and father would go to Western Canada to work in the mills. It was told to Dorothy and Bill that father was going on a business trip. The only thing he forgot to do was come back. And he didn't come back. And Bill felt mortally abandoned. Can I relate to Bill? You bet I can. There are people who left my life. Maybe they died. Maybe they just moved away. Maybe our lives just sort of went in some different directions, and it always left me wanting more. Separation and, and, and detachment have always been difficult for me. Maybe they're difficult for you, too. And so can I relate to Bill? You bet I can. And the, the liquor that he's discovering is something called a cordial. I don't really know what a cordial is. I'm not a drinker. If he was talking about Kit Kat bars or Almond Joy bars, that I know about, but I don't know about cordials. But I know it's something that he really, really enjoyed. I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. So he's on vacation. No, he's not really on vacation. He's a soldier. He's away from home. And he decides to take action drinking that he would not normally take. Can I relate to that? How many diets of mine melted like snow in July when I was away from home? Or when the watchful eye of somebody that I was afraid to confront was no longer there, I was free to eat and usually did. Can I relate to him? Yes, I can. My whole life, people have been telling me, if you would just lose weight, life would be better. My whole life, people would say to me, fat boys don't get girlfriends. Fat boys don't get good jobs. Fat boys don't get to be on the baseball team. Fat boys don't get to do this or don't get to do that. And I heard them, and I understood that they were right. And there I was eating whatever, fill in the blank, pizza, french fries, candy, ice cream. There I was. And Dr. Silkworth says to me, in the doctor's opinion, the pursuance of this effect will lead us to insanity or death. And how many of us have followed the pursuit of that effect to the gates of death door? Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. In time, we sail for over there. Over there denotes World War I. You've all heard the song, over there, ba 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 I'm not much of a singer, but that's the song from World War I. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. Let's stop right there. It doesn't say I was very thirsty and needed a drink. It didn't say anything. It said I was very lonely and, again, turned to alcohol. This sentence 
is very telltale. It is a window into the soul of Bill Wilson. It is a window into the soul of Harlan Grabowski. I was very lonely and again turned to Kit Kat bars. I was very lonely and again turned to ice cream. When I was in my 20s and life was getting away from me, my mother died when I was 22. My father died when I was 24. I came into Overeaters Anonymous when I was almost 25 but still 24. But later on, after I graduated, I would be sitting alone on a Friday night and I would be eating myself into a stupor with tears running down my face. I was five, six hundred pounds at this time or more. Lonely. I had never been on a date with a girl yet in my life. I had never held a girl's hand. I had never known what it was like to be part of life. Even in the middle of people who I knew loved me and I loved them back, I was alone and different and compared and despaired. And if you had asked me at a very early age or then what I was really feeling and thinking, I would have told you I was jealous of the people around me just because they weren't me. And I was afraid of them, and I didn't have any reason to be afraid of them. I was afraid that they were going to hurt me, and sometimes they did. And what I didn't understand was that sometimes people hurt other people, and they don't really mean to, and that I could survive it. And I felt alone, and I felt different. Now, I'm going to say something here that only a compulsive overeater will understand because when it says here, I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol, I ate railroad cars full of Chips Ahoy cookies because I needed to kill the shame and kill the guilt and kill the feelings of what it was like to eat railroad cars full of Chips Ahoy cookies. I was very lonely And I turned to the one thing that would make me more lonely. So the lonelier I got, the fatter I got. And the fatter I got, the lonelier I got. And the lonelier I got, the fatter I got. And so we see that the disease of compulsive overeating, like Bill's alcoholism, is a death sentence unless acted upon by a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, that I will eventually eat myself to death because I am biologically predisposed to do so. My mind cannot stand the pain of not eating. And my body cannot eat, have that food inside of it without developing the phenomenon of craving. In other words, the physical allergy. Now, I'm going to say something that most of you have heard me say umpteen zillion times. I'm going to again remind you that alcohol for Bill, wait, before I start this diatribe, I want to again remind you too. It's not always the ingestion of food that can make me a compulsive overeater. There are people on this line that you would look at those people and you would think to yourself, man, they don't know what I'm going through. They don't look like I look because I'm morbidly obese. And they're not. But maybe they have anorexia where they were literally starving themselves to death when food was very plentiful and readily accessible to them. They were getting a high from not eating. They were getting a high from restricting their intake of food. And some of these people are dizzyingly beautiful. And some of these people, their outer shell would not reflect what I'm telling you. But they were in such torrid pain, 
such horrible pain that they were deliberately starving themselves to death in an attempt to control themselves and the world around them because their brains could not take the pain that it saw around it. And the buildup of human emotions was too great. There were also people on this line right now who are compulsive overeaters who may not show that they're compulsive overeaters with an obese body or a history of obesity, but they're bulimic. They purge using laxatives or they purge using vomiting or they purge using a combination of vomiting and exercise or exercise alone. There's exercise bulimia, there's laxative bulimia, there's regurgitation bulimia. They eat massive quantities of food and then they purge the food out of their system. It's an extremely unhealthy thing to do. And I'm reminded of my friend Lauren, young, beautiful, brilliant. Both parents were physicians. She used to get weighed at the treatment centers and keep toothpaste and combs and hair clips and scrunchies in her pockets so that she would weigh a little bit more and they wouldn't get on her when she knew she had been seriously restricting. She never saw her 40th birthday. She's dead. She's dead. Did she have an obese body? No. Was she beautiful? Yes. Was she brilliant? Yes. Did she have all the money she could ever want? Yes. And she's dead. So let's get back. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. And that's again proving the fact that food was never the problem in the first place. That the problem is the buildup of everyday normal human emotion and we lack the power to control our reaction to the world as it's going on around us lack of power was our dilemma but we have this emotional buildup which our brain cannot take we call upon willpower and we have none and the only thing we know to do is eat because eating will change the perception that we have of reality. Food does something for me that it does not do for the normal temperate eater. It changes instantly my perception of reality. So when Bill would take a cordial or a beer or whatever, or for me, Chips Ahoy cookies or, or whatever, it didn't matter, Saturday morning right now, and since I'm home and I'm normally not home at this time, I'm home now. I was flooded this morning with memories of the Saturday morning cartoons. I'm 65 years old. Maybe some of you can remember the days way before cable. But when I was a little boy, they'd have George of the Jungle, and they'd have um, Superman, and they'd have uh, Mickey, Mighty Mouse, and they'd have all these, the Beatles cartoons, and they'd have all these great cartoons, and Hoppity Hooper, and all these other various ones, and Rocky and Bullwinkle were on Saturday morning, too, and he had all these great cartoons like Heckle and Jekyll, and, and Pixie and Dixie, and all these other ones, and if you're my age, you're probably laughing right now, just remembering them and then there was Yaki and Chopper and all these other ones and oh it was fun and we'd sit in front of the TV set and we'd watch cartoons on Saturday morning and I would eat massive quantities of Frosted Flakes and massive quantities of cake and pie and cookies and God knows what but I couldn't bear being in that room with my friends that would come over and not eat. Because even though they were sitting right next to me, I felt alone and alienated in a crowd. 
So food was never the problem. Food was the solution to the problem. Food became the solution to the problem. See, if food was the problem, hospitals would turn out winners, and they don't. If food was the problem, losing weight would work, and it doesn't. There's not a person on this line that's a compulsive overeater to the obese side of things that he hasn't lost a lot of weight. I have a friend who lives in New Jersey. She's a former school teacher. She talks about gaining and losing the same 100 pounds eight, nine times, up 100, down 100, up 100, down 100. And my cardiologist has said to me on several different occasions, that is more dangerous and, you know, than, than being a bit obese. But yet she would gain and lose and gain and lose and gain and lose. Why? Because losing the weight didn't fix her. So food wasn't the problem. Food was the solution to the problem. So this sentence, I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol, is a garage door size window into Bill's brain. And this is a sentence that's passed over in most, meet, most meetings. We read the sentence and we don't even, nobody even talks about it unless you're here at the North Scottsdale Fellowship Club. Then there's a chubby guy who was from, is from Chicago and he'll talk about it most of the time. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a dog row on an old tombstone. Now we're going to we're going to look at this in a way that may be a little different from anything you've experienced before. Here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold, small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. Now, what does this say? Here lies a Hampshire grenadier. We know of New Hampshire, New Hampshire. In Hampshire, in England, this guy, Thatcher, we're going to talk in the few weeks, we're going to talk about a guy whose name is Thatcher, and he's going to play very prominently in us being together this morning. He's been dead for a while, since the 60s, but he's going to play very prominently in us being together here this morning, and his name is Thatcher. But here lies a Hampshire grenadier, a grenadier is a soldier, who caught his death drinking cold, small beer. He wasn't killed in battle. He didn't die because he contracted a disease. He died drinking cold, small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. Now let's take a look at that pot thing. See, they're not talking about marijuana. They're talking about beer. And that's not as apparent to most of the people on the line here this morning, or maybe if you've listened to some of my podcasts, you've heard me describe this. But this pot is how they drank beer in England at that time. You see, it was considered extremely bad manners to sit and drink. You stood in the inn or you stood in the saloon and drank and you stood at a bar that was constructed in the saloon and leaned against a bar and that's where the name comes from and you drank your beer in quart pots or pint pots. Quarts is equal to two pints. A pint is one half of a quart. And you would get this pot of beer, whether it be quarts or pints, and you would consume your beer standing up. That is why as an homage to that, beer, or excuse me, bar stools are always higher than kitchen furniture, than dining room furniture, than living room furniture. As an homage to those days, we have a bar and it is always elevated as an homage to the days when it was considered very bad manners to sit and drink. So he, this Hampshire grenadier would drink his beer 
and it killed him. In other words, he died of alcoholism. And in the late 1600s, a little bit after this guy died, and in the early 1700s, when the expression in England was, watch your pints and quarts, because the barkeeper would say to the boys drinking, watch your pints and quarts, you're getting a little rowdy over there. When that expression came over to the colonies, about 80 years, 90 years before we became America, it turned into watch your P's and Q's, and that's where that comes into our language today. But before it was watch your P's and Q's, it was watch your pots, watch your pints and quarts. And this guy died of drinking. And Bill is looking at this dog roll on the tombstone, and he's remembering that he's been doing some drinking himself. But he's also remembering Daddy left because he was a drunk. And Grandpa and Grandma were always at each other's throats because Grandpa was a drunk. Now, Grandpa Wilson became dry drunk after a hike up on Mount Elias, and he said he felt the wind blow through, and he never drank again, but he had no recovery, and he was a dry drunk. And if you've been around this meeting a while, or you've been around me for a while, you know that these dry drunks, most of them are miserable. They have no program. They're angry. They're, they're scared. They're angry. They can be very, very difficult to be around because they don't have a program and they don't have any way of, of feeling better. They're not drinking and they're not working steps, so they just, they're just miserable. Right, let's continue and let's look at some of the things that maybe are not as apparent from some of your previous studies of this chapter. Ominous warning, which I failed to heed. In other words, Dr. Silkworth is going to tell us that we see other people drinking or eating in our case and they don't get punished. In other words, they don't have any type of consequence. And many of us have friends who can eat and eat and eat, and seemingly they don't have any type of punishment. I've told you about my friend Corwin. He lives in Chicago. He and I could go to a buffet today, although the buffets are all closed down now, but let's just forget that for a minute. Let's just say we went to a buffet. He could out-eat me. I mean, this guy can put it away. He's never probably weighed over 190 in his life. This guy can put food away like you could not believe. People used to say to him, man, you got a hollow leg. But here's the difference. He won't, let's see, today's Saturday. He won't think about eating until Monday or Tuesday. Won't even cross his mind. I'll be eating at a convenience store on my way home from the buffet. Because at the buffet, I'm going to trigger the physical allergy. I'm going to eat foods and ingredients that are going to set me up with an actual physical craving for more of the same. <clears throat> and he won't even think about eating until Monday or Tuesday. Can I relate to Bill Wilson looking right at this tombstone and continuing to drink? You bet I can. Because his mind and body are conspiring against him to excuse the behavior that he knows is horrible, but he cannot stop it because he has no way of turning off the pain. He has no way of dealing with the buildup of emotions. He's scared. He's in a war. He's away from his family. He's in England. You take me out of my element and I get scared too. I do a lot of traveling. A lot of my traveling now is canceled. Boy, I've got nice credits with a couple of airlines as the result of some of this stuff. But anyway, back to this. Um, you take me out of my element and I, I get squirrely. I get crazy. And I know that the people there invited me there because they want me there. And I know that eventually I'll get home. I know that everything is okay. I know that there's no external emergency, and yet I still feel misplaced because of travel much of the time. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? 
You bet I can. And I do. Let's continue. 22 and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. Now he's home from World War I. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation, my talent for leadership, I imagine, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. He's home from the war now. The war is going to end 1918. He's, going to, he's coming home, and he is now very full of dreams and very full of aspirations, and he knows, he's confident, he knows things are going to be really okay for him. He marries Lois before he goes, so he's a married man when he returns. He's going to, he's going to know in his mind that everything is just going to be fantastic. He is just confident, confident, confident. He marries Lois on January 24th, 1918. So the bottom line is he is, and the war didn't end until later. I'm sorry, I said it ended in 18. It didn't. But I got my date screwed up. But he marries Lois, goes to war, and then comes back a married man. That's better. Okay. So he's coming back full of aspirations. Let's see where he goes from there. I took a night law course and obtained employment as investigator for a surety company. That means he's investigating for an insurance company. A surety company and insurance and surety have the same root word. This is insurance and he's an investigator. He's investigating fraud. He's investigating insurance fraud, and that's what he's doing for a living. He goes to the Brooklyn Law School, and there's a Headley School in Brooklyn that's four blocks from where they live. And this Headley School was offering night law courses for returning soldiers. And these guys would go up there and they would try to get, you know, different degrees or different things so that they could go on and, you know, do something with their lives. The drive for success was on. I would proved to the world I was important. My work took me about Wall Street, and little by little, I became interested in the market. So he's going into Wall Street as an investigator for this insurance company, and he's bumping up against these guys that are stockbrokers, and these guys that are investment counselors, and these guys that are associated with the hubbub and the excitement of Wall Street. Many people lost money. Excuse me. I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. Now, the key word here is nearly. He is going to pass his law course, and he is an attorney, but he will never practice law. We will never hear of Bill practicing law, but he did pass his course. It says nearly, it doesn't say I failed. And and, and in researching his life, you see that he he does pass his course. Now, at one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. Now, let's stop right there. Let's go to the previous page. Flip over your book. If you've got a book in front of you, go over to your previous page. At the bottom of the page, it says here, I, uh, my talent for leadership, I imagine, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. Now go back to page two. Now what we're seeing here is something that is not pointed out by most sponsors. It is not pointed out in meetings. It is not talked about, and I don't have the time to talk about it on podcasts because you only have 60, 70, 90 minutes, whatever it is on a podcast. You can't talk about everything that we can talk about here. We are seeing the progression of Bill's alcoholism. Progression. Now, what are we going to learn in Chapter 3? And that information is going to come from the common sense of drinking by Richard Peabody. Richard Peabody wrote a book in 1931. And and this book is one of the four books that makes up the big book. And the book is called The Common Sense of Drinking. In 1936, Peabody will die of his own alcoholism 
three years before the big book will be printed. But so important is the common sense of drinking that Bill Wilson's personal copy of The Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody is on display at the AA archives as we sit here. Now, what did Bill Wilson learn from, from Peabody, and what are we seeing here in Bill's story? We are seeing the progression of Bill's alcoholism. In other words, his disease is getting worse over time, never better. His disease is progressing. It's getting worse. So we have a fantasy when we're young, some of us. I had it. I assume some of you did too. We assume this lie. Here's the lie. Someday, this is all going to get better. Someday I'm going to be thin. Someday I'm going to be good looking or whatever it is we, you know, whatever it is. And that day doesn't come. And so here's Bill coming out of World War I, sure of himself, absolutely certain that he is going to do great things in this world. And at one of the finals, he was too drunk to think or write. In other words, Bill's alcoholism is now dictating where he can go and where he cannot go, what he can do and where, what he cannot do. It's closing doors to him, and that's exactly what it did to me. No one ever shut me down. No one ever did to me what this disease did to me. And we see that Bill is struggling to complete this test in law school because he's too drunk to think or write. And how many of us lost out on promotion, lost out on opportunity, lost out on love, lost out on all the things that are inherently normal for a human being to enjoy and aspire to because we had an illness that was permanent, progressive, and fatal. Peabody teaches us that disease is permanent. There's no permanent cure. It is progressive. It gets worse over time, never better. It is fatal. I don't care what they write on your death certificate. My mother had her leg amputated from diabetes. My mother was a sneak eater. My mother was 275 pounds, 300 pounds. And she would weight you out. If we were eating dinner, she would eat like a bird. And then when we fell asleep, she'd eat the kitchen. And they put down on her death certificate, pneumonia. Yeah, pneumonia, my, my butt. She died from compulsive overeating. My father also died of cancer. But they put on the death certificate, cause of death, pneumonia. And that's funny because that's usually what gets you in the end is pneumonia. But how did you get the pneumonia? That, that's what they don't put down. They don't put down, yeah, she got pneumonia because she was 300 pounds. Okay, so here is the disease, and it's baffling to Bill. So let's see where he goes from here. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. We had long talks when I would still her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk, that the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. What is he doing here? He's lying to himself and he's lying to Lois. I don't know if he bought his own BS, but she sure didn't. She didn't buy his BS. And the first victim of compulsive overeating, the first victim of alcoholism, the first victim of any compulsion is the truth. Honesty is the first concept to go out the window when this disease is being practiced. 
There is nothing, there is nothing that goeth before the beginning of a binge. Nothing goes before the truth. Dr. Silkworth says we cannot tell the true from the false. To us, our alcoholic life seems the only normal one. What does that mean? It means every single time I eat ice cream, I am going to eat more ice cream than I had originally planned, and then I'm going to graduate to McDonald's, then I'm going to graduate to Chips Ahoy, and whatever that salt and sugar and salt and sugar and salt and sugar, it's never going to stop with a pint of ice cream. It's never going to stop with a gallon of ice cream. It's never going to stop with a railroad car full of ice cream. There isn't enough ice cream in the world. If they brought it to my, if there were cows in my backyard and they were making ice cream out of the milk 24-7, it would not be enough. And again, to be fair, if I was bulimic, it wouldn't be enough. If I was a restrictor, I couldn't be thin enough. There are behaviors that go with our disease that have very little to do with being morbidly obese. There's restricting, and there's bulimia, and there's exercise bulimia, there's laxative bulimia, and there's vomiting bulimia. Some of us have side addictions, shopping, sex and love, uh, drugs, How do most of these amphetamine people get started on amphetamines? They're using street drugs to try to control their intake of food. A lot of alcoholics who come into OA used alcohol. I happen to know one very well. He lives in Oklahoma. He's a really great guy. He's not feeling too well this morning. He used alcohol to try to control his intake of food. And so... We have various behaviors around eating food, some eating more, some eating less, some eating way less, some eating massive quantities and purging it out, but it's all the same thing. And what is the first thing that has to go? The first thing that has to go is honesty. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, A, we don't want to be doing that, and B, we... We know better. We know that one is going to lead to two, and two is going to lead to seven, and seven is going to lead to 38. I have a friend who lives near Chicago, and he has a daughter that's allergic to peanuts. She has a severe acute peanut allergy. But she doesn't say to to herself, people that eat peanuts do the greatest things in the world, so I'm going to eat the peanuts anyway. She doesn't say that. And she doesn't have to go to Peanuts Anonymous. She knows that if she eats nuts that come off a tree or come out of the ground, she's going to get acutely sick right away. And she has to keep an EpiPen handy. Or she has to get to an emergency room immediately with do not pass go, do not collect $200. She has to go to the emergency room right now, right now. Yesterday would be fine because her throat closes up and she can't breathe when she eats peanuts. She does not say to herself, maybe if I eat them unsalted, it won't bother me. She doesn't say to herself, maybe if I eat them dry roasted, it won't bother me. Maybe if I just eat peanuts at the ball game, it won't bother me. Well, I'm out of town. I might as well eat some peanuts because nobody here knows I'm allergic to peanuts. So now that I'm visiting Denver, Colorado, I'm going to eat some peanuts and nobody will know the difference. She doesn't do that. And the reason that she doesn't do that is peanuts do not do for her what liquor does for Bill and what Chips Ahoy cookies and Kit Kat bars do for me. And that illusion, excuse me, not illusion, that effect is so elusive that I will pursue it to the gates of insanity or death. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? 
you bet I can. He doesn't want to be hurting Lois. He loves Lois. Lois is the love of his life. Lois is the love of his life. He doesn't want to hurt her. But he sure as hell doesn't want to give up liquor either. Let's take a look at the next paragraph and see how far we get. By the time I had... so Wait, before we do anything. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. And hopefully in doing this in such a detailed way, you can too. Maybe this will draw you in a little closer to an identification with what he's going through because that's the original intent of the chapter is you identify in and then after this we go together down the path of recovery. I'm on page two. By the time I had completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. A maelstrom is a great uh, disturbance, a great uh, excitement, great excitement. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved $1,000. Now, I want to talk about this for just a second because I want to give you historical perspective of what you're seeing here. See, you can look at that and he saved $1,000. And it doesn't mean much. Hopefully, I'm telling the truth here. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not saying something that's not applicable to you. Uh, everyone on this line has access to $1,000. You have a credit card in your pocket. You have a debit card in your pocket. You're working or you're whatever, and hopefully you have access to $1,000. Not a lot of money today. If you don't have it, I'm sorry. I'm just using this as a way of explaining my point. $1,000 in the 1920s was a lot of money. You could buy not one, two new cars at that time for $1,000. You had Ford Model A. Ford Model A at that time was $495 off the showroom floor brand new. $1,000 was a lot. You could buy a home in Chicago at that time for anywhere between $1,200, $1,800 with a backyard I don't know about a white picket fence, whatever, but you could get a nice home in a nice area for about fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars. So when you read this thousand dollars, understand he's doing very well. Okay? That's the reason I go into this. It went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagine that they would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and management, but my wife and I decided to go anyway. I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. Now let's take a look at what's happening here. Bill Wilson... <clears throat> excuse me, is not a stockbroker. He self-describes as a stockbroker. He's not. What he is, is he is a New York City stock speculator. And he makes his living, because his opinions were sought after, he makes his living selling his ideas on what stocks are going to be hot and what stocks are going to be not to others who are investing. And if he's right, they gladly cut him in on the profits. But the 1920s was not different from what America was like uh, right around the time before 9-11, and right around that time, stocks were up and up and up. And every time you looked at the stock market, it was just going crazy. And Bill Wilson said, what goes up must come down. 
we need more information on these companies. I told you he was smart right at the beginning of our session today, did I not? I told you he was very intelligent. And the people on Wall Street that he went to to try to bankroll his travel and bankroll his situation said to him, oh, you're nuts. What are you so worried about? My God, everybody's making money. Everybody's doing well. Everybody's doing fantastic. Why do you have to stir up all this stuff? So he goes to Lois. Now, here's the deal that's not in this book. Lois doesn't want to go. She don't want to run around the country on a Harley Davidson motorcycle in the sidecar. She doesn't want to leave home for months at a time. She doesn't want to do that. But here's the deal she makes. Because remember, Lois is the co-founder of Al-Anon, right? So she makes a deal. Oh, you want this, huh? Oh, okay. I'll cut you a deal, Mr. Wilson. I'll agree to go with you, but you agree no drinking. So, of course, what is the first thing an alcoholic does to get his way? He lies. He tells Lois, oh, okay, Lo, if you want to do this, you're right. No drinking. I promise that if you come with me and we go to these companies, I won't drink. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous. That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. How's he going to get these guys to give him information? He's going to meet them at the local bar. Let's go to the next paragraph. We gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuffed with tent blankets, a change of clothes, and three huge volumes of a financial reference service, our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there and the use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year now this is a big paragraph I don't usually do one paragraph like that we usually break it up but this reads better and understands better when we sort of take it you know by the whole thing they're going around and he's giving these reports back to certain people on Wall Street and he really really gets a very positive kind of feedback from them they like the information. In other words, they didn't know what was good for them. He's giving them this, these, these reports. He's calling in, and they like it, and they give him a large expense account, and he's a darling of Wall Street, and, he's, and, and they option him some stock, and it leaves him with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. Do you remember what we talked about in the doctor's opinion, how in 1929, on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, how Dr. Silkworth was over-invested in the stock market, and he went to Charlie Towns, and he got a job. Now, remember that Dr. Silkworth was a doctor, that little word, Dr. Silkworth. Silkworth should tip you off. Dr. Silkworth was a medical doctor, and his salary at the town's hospital was $35 a week. If you were making $20 a week, $15 a week at that time, you were probably doing okay. You could get a steak dinner at that time for 15 cents. You could spend the night in a hotel for 15, 20 cents. So when you read these words, we were left with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. He's making surgeon money. He's making very, very good money. They're living on Park Avenue. He buys Lois fur coats. He buys her the piano that she's wanted from the time she was a child, and she was a physician's daughter. He's buying her dresses that only the elite can wear. He's wearing suits 
that only the elite can wear. He is living a good life, but he's drinking. Now, next week, we're going to see again the progression of Bill's alcoholism and how it accelerates over time. We're going to see the progression and we're going to see the acceleration of that progression and we're going to be talking about where Bill and Lois go from here. But it is very, very important, very important that we see in the reading today that Bill lied. Bill drank, even though he had reasons not to. His parents split up because of alcoholism. His grandparents had a miserable relationship because of alcoholism. He has been warned by mom and warned by grandpa and warned by grandma never to drink, Bill. Don't drink. He drinks anyway. What does the drinking do for him? It gives him a feeling of being part of life at last. In other words, for the time he was drinking, the puzzle piece fit together perfectly. What is that puzzle piece? The puzzle piece is that click that you feel when the Oreo cookie is in your mouth and you've got a whole bag of Oreo cookies that you haven't consumed yet, and that first Oreo cookie and second Oreo cookie are in you, and even though the physical allergy is manifesting itself, for about 10 seconds, you feel like you're part of the world. The lies, the progression hurting other people. All of that stuff, what does that mean to me? It means I can relate to Bill Wilson. Can I relate to the way he thinks? Yes. Can I relate to the way he drinks? Yes. That's what's important to do. Now, We're going to start doing something today, and we're going to do it for about 10 minutes that we've never done before because I never could do it before. Usually I'm starting to gather people up, and we're going to go to the Pita Jungle in Scottsdale, and we're going to throw out our coffee cups, and we're going to go over to Pita Jungle and get lunch and continue our discussion. But that's not going to happen today. We're done for today. We're going to pick this up next week on page 3. I've marked the spot. We're going to pick this up on page three. But what I would like to do today is open it up for a couple of questions. And you can, before I tell you to hit star six, this is my rules. I do not feel it is prudent to waste time on food questions. Please don't sit and ask me what's my food plan. It's a waste of time. I'm a 65-year-old man. What my food plan is isn't going to help you, and what your food plan is isn't going to help me. So let's do no food questions, and let's just try to limit our questions to the reading that we just completed. So that said, I'm going to let the recording continue to go, and Pam, I hope you're doing the same. And if you'll notice, there was no noise on the line this week because Pam out in North Carolina uh, figure out a way to to mute the line, which was great. But let's, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself by hitting star six, and I'll do the best I can to answer it. Star six to unmute. I I must have covered the material pretty good. Harlan, this is my PJ. Hi, you know, what what occurs to me, and I don't know if it if it occurs to you as strongly, but I'm just shocked at how this all with the Great Depression and all the misery of the time and the impact on the fellowship and the how that seems to just tie in so much with this coronavirus and what we're all going through. Does that do you feel that too? I think that life is a wheel. 
And I think it's a wheel because it doesn't matter what the situation is. You just keep coming back to the same ups and downs, the same ups and downs that you come to. Uh, my memory uh, flashes back to good times. It flashes back to bad times, whatever that is, either individual or, or as a nation or as a world. In this case, this is not just a national thing. This is an, an international thing. We go up, we go down, and we go around. Round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody knows. And I think the real lesson here is you never know what's coming, so just enjoy the moment and do the best you can. And for me, it's, it's remembering this. There is nothing going on in my life right now that eating more food will not make worse. Eating more food is going to make it worse. So, yeah, I think it does tie in. And we're going to see some of the paragraphs of the book in, in Bill's story, how he struggles with this, with this idea of a god, and he sees the wars, the chicanery, and all this other stuff. He's going to look around and see what we see today. Why should I believe in God if, and then you can just fill in the blank, you know, if there's Martians walking down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, why should I believe in God? If there's whatever, you know, why should I believe in God? And, 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 and I hope that answers it. But before I forget, I want to also put something out to the group here that's assembled. And this doesn't have anything to do with your question, Nance, but this is, this is what I'm... I want a place to um, store these recordings. If anybody here knows how to set up a website, not a fancy one, but just one where I can list where I'm going and we can store these so people can, can access them, it would really be helpful. So if you know how to do that kind of thing, call me later and let's, let's get together and let's get that done. Okay. Nancy, I hope that answers it. Does anybody else have it a did. question this morning? It did. Michelle Y. Michelle Y. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Harlan. I'm new to Vision, very new, uh, and I appreciate your sharing. Thanks. I, 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 you're talking briefly about the click, you know, and you said 10 seconds. And do you think that that, as the, the, the illness progresses, that that gets, that window gets narrower? Yes, or? absolutely do, Yes. What, what used to work for me, let's go back to my childhood, and, and I bet okay. yours too. I don't know your history, Michelle, and I'm glad okay. you asked the question. One Rice Krispie tree could get me high as a kite when I was five. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich could make me so euphoric. I'd be running, I'd be screaming, I'd be, you know, whatever it is. And as I progressed, the click got shorter and shorter mm -hmm. And it, needed, it needs more food to get me off than it used to. And in the life of an alcoholic, they need more and more liquor as time goes by. In the life of a compulsive overeater, I needed more and more food to give me that click. And the click lasted a shorter and shorter period of time. So that in the final years of my really heavy eating, Michelle, I was mm -hmm. eating massive quantities of food. And in one of the stories in the big book, it says, I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't get sober. I couldn't eat enough food. And for me to make a statement like, I couldn't eat enough food, my God, I was eating every waking moment of my life. Mm -hmm. I still could not achieve that high. I couldn't do it. And so, yes, I believe that the click gets the effect is what I'm really talking about. That click gets less and less, and it takes more and more food to get there. He is the best today I've ever heard him. Thank He's a you, genius. Man. In this Thank area, you. Walter, a genius, the way he conceptualizes things. Thank you. But let's, let's hit star six to remute. Okay, let's hit star six to remute. But, Michelle, I oh, hope that sorry, answers the sorry. question. Let's do Barbara, one. That's okay. Please. We love you anyway. You're the president of my fan club. That's okay. One more Harley. question, and then I'll let you Barbara. guys get to, get to your day. Harley, Harley I have a Lori. question. Okay, go oh. for it. Who, Lori or? Who's the, the male voice I heard? I'll probably take two more, but who's the male voice I heard? Oh, okay. No problem. Harlan, this is Dave. Dave, okay. Dave in, in Port Towns in Washington. Uh, the effect. Yeah. Have, when, you, when you run across a dually 
uh, guys in Aki, as well as the food, the food addict. Yeah. Is there the dilemma that's, that my interpretation of, of my life is that alcohol never quit working and food immediately quit working for me. Okay. And I chased it and chased it and chased it for years. And, and yet it never worked. I was going to eat it and believing that it would help, whether it was a Ritz cracker or, or whether it was, you know, the Ritz cracker, it's not a big deal, mm-hmm. or whether it was a bowl of ice cream. I believed it was going to help, and it never, ever no. worked. Unfortunately for the compulsive overeater, the high is the shortest high of any addictive substance. Alcoholics can stay drunk for a Longer, much longer periods of time. Drug addicts can stay high for much longer periods of time. But the food addict has to keep chasing and chasing and chasing because the click or the effect, it has such a diminished lifespan that you barely even know it's there after a time and you're just eating voraciously or starving dangerously or purging dangerously in search of that effect. I know a woman who's in OA for a long, long time, and she can't wear skirts or dresses. Why can't she wear skirts or dresses? Because she was a cutter, and she has scars on the top of her legs from cutting. And she told me one time that... um, it, it, it just it kept diminishing, and she'd have to cut, and she was hospitalized in, in a psych hospital three or four times. Before she was 15, she had been in the psych hospital six or seven times. So the, the effect that we're, that we're seeking, David, in food is the shortest of all the lifespans of, of that effect. I am not an alcoholic. I cannot speak to alcoholism. I cannot speak to feeling that click from alcohol. So I can't really answer that from firsthand experience because I'm not an alcoholic and I'm not a drug addict. Um, but I do know that the click or the effect from the food, after I was probably 10 years old, it was barely there. But the food kept making me fatter and fatter. By the time I graduated high school, I went to Mather High School in Chicago on the north side. I'm a Mather boy. I'm a Mather Ranger um, and a proud Mather Ranger. Um, I was 335 pounds as a senior in high school with a 48-inch waist as a senior in high school, and I couldn't get high on the food anymore. But I just kept eating it and eating it and eating it. And it says in the doctor's opinion on page XXVIII, 28 in Roman numerals, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it's injurious, in other words, we know we're killing ourselves, we're doing it anyway, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. In other words, we know we're killing ourselves. We know we're not going to be able to eat just one. You mentioned Ritz crackers. Show of hands, how many people ate just one Ritz cracker unless it was the last one you could get your hands on? Ain't going to happen. There's not a hand in the air, and I can see all of you. The bottom line is we know we're going to trigger that allergy, even though we don't know there is an allergy. What do we know? If I eat one McDonald's cheeseburger, I'm going to eat 10. If I eat one potato chip, I'm going to eat a million of them. What was the advertising? I don't know if you, you know, advertising was a lot more localized when I was a kid than it is today. What was the advertising for for potato chips? In Chicago, we had Jay's potato chips. And Jay's potato chips used to advertise, can't eat just one. Can't eat just one. Notice they didn't, they didn't, you know, advertise steaks that way or, you know, whatever. I can't eat one potato chip unless it's the last one. So I hope that answers it. I'm gonna, whoever that female voice was, I'll take that question to, and then I'll let you guys go. There was a female voice that had a question. Oh, David, I hope yeah, that answers that it for me. you. Yeah, that was me. Okay. Who's hey, me? Cora, hi, can you hear me? So, yeah. yeah, my daughter just walked in. So okay. um, I'm in the midst of the progression Okay. Oh boy. I'm really, really, really frightened. Okay. I, 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 I assure you, you should be. 
But anyway, what's your have, name? Uh, Lori. Lori. Lori, okay. And I don't know how to stop it. You don't know how to stop it, and okay. I'm afraid I won't. Okay. You and do know how to stop it, and I'm going to tell you again how I stopped it. You have okay. to put down the food, Lori. You have okay. to put it down. You have to see it okay. and desist. And you are powerless over food, but you're not helpless. You have a fellowship of people around you. You have podcasts. You have meetings. Well, of course, now it's a little tough. You have all these various tools at your, be- at your uh, beck and call, and you're going to have to gut it out for a couple of days, and you can start working the steps after two days with a sponsor. Today is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. Monday morning will be day three. You can start working the steps. And at the end of the second meeting on Sunday, or on Monday, rather, at the end of the second meeting on Monday, there are going to be people that are going to identify in as sponsors. Jot down right, their numbers. I, okay, okay. Which I, I, I've heard that, okay. And start um, calling some of those people. But yes, you can, and it is going to suck. And it is going to be gut-wrenching to put the food down. And you know how they say, put the food down, you'll feel better? Lori, you're going to feel anger better. You're going to feel fear better. You're going to feel like killing someone better. You're going to feel like ripping the top of somebody's head off better. But you can do it. And then you start working the steps, and the desire to eat will leave you so that you can be abstinent and be happy about it. Right now, you can't be abstinent and be happy about it, but you will be able to. We are here to support you. You reach out to any of us, Lori. Do you want to give your phone number right now, or you'd rather not? Um, um, No, I can Okay, Okay, why don't you give your phone number, and there are people on this line that will help support you through. Give us your phone okay. number. 562. 562. 577. 577. 5379. 5379. That's Lori. 562. 577. 5379. And what state are you in, Lori? California. California is Pacific time. Okay, that's California. She's on Pacific time. And Lori needs support in the next couple of days, and she needs it always, but she needs it in the next couple of days because she's going through that beginning phases of abstinent, that gut-wrenching beginning phases. And Lori, you have, you have, if you don't have my phone number, it's 480-495-8961. Mm-hmm. That's 480 480- 495 Four nine five eight nine six one. I'm on the same time as Pacific time. I live in Arizona, so I'm on the same time you're on. If you need me, I'm here for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can't say let's go to the coffee pl- or let's go to the Pita Jungle, guys. But I'm going to turn you guys loose. I hope this was helpful, and I hope that you guys okay. glean some things out of this Bill story that maybe were not as apparent to you before, but hopefully it will help you to understand how to identify in with the way he thinks and the way he drinks so that you can more closely identify and hopefully it will help the people that you end up sponsoring so you can teach this to them and in teaching it to them you'll learn it a little closer for yourself. Okay? All right, guys, have a great day. Stay safe and uh, good hunt. Good. Have a great day. Bye bye guys. Thank Thanks, Harlan. You, Harlan. It was bye, guys. Thank oh, you. I better turn bye. off the re- I better turn off the recording. Thanks everybody. Recording. Thank you.